Um, this podcast is brought to you by the Almamac and Scientific Canada. It was recorded on the traditional territories shared between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Enjoy. I feel like I just butchered that again, even though we That's close enough. <laughs> we just had the conversation. Okay. My research on <laughs> uh, light adaptation in the in the fish right now. I'm sitting in a kiddie pool, actually. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite nice. Oh, that would be great. But it's oh, uh, not very professional. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. As you might notice, this is a bit of a different intro than before. I'm just trying some new stuff out, so I don't know. Maybe this will take. But uh, today we have a very special guest. We've had her on before, Carmen Lee. She is my ex-office mate. Uh, she's a soft matter physicist. She is just a all-around very impressive person. Um, she is a Vanier scholar. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's a very uh, up there scholarship for Canadians. Uh, she's doing her PhD and she's going to talk about that. She's going to talk about her research. Um, yeah, she's she's always a pleasure to have on the show. I really enjoy talking to her. I really miss having her as an office mate too. I don't know if that will come across in the interview, but uh, but uh, once all this pandemic stuff is done, if I'm back in that office, I'm really looking forward to, to goofing around with uh, with Carmen again. So... Without further ado, here's Carmen Lee, and we're talking physics. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Adam, and today we have a very special guest. You've seen her before, if you are a fan of the show. Uh, Carmen, hello, welcome back. Hey, Adam, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Yeah. Um, it's been a while. It's been, what, a year? Since I've been on the show? Yes. <laughs> Since group um, <laughs> it's group meeting. Uh, it's been a while. I think I was like, I was last on maybe more than a year ago. Yeah, it was in person. I just, it might have been in a coffee shop. It was definitely in a coffee shop. Yeah. And I feel like I was also one of your original invitees. So I feel very proud to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Things have changed. Things have stayed the same. We're still in the same lab group. We're still doing soft matter research. What's what's new? What's uh... honestly, life is pretty much the same for me, apart from just not going into work. Like I'm super privileged from that point of view. Nothing, like I don't have any huge worry about like people that I live with getting sick. Right. I don't have young children. So I'm able to work regular hours. The worst part is like not being able to go to a coffee shop. I really miss those conversations. Yeah. Those coffee shop I conversations. Just, I just love overhearing what random people are doing. Yeah. And I don't get that anymore. And their horrible business ventures. Oh man, that was such a good conversation. <laughs> I'm getting my fill of that from uh, watching trashy TV shows. Uh, okay. And are also you... keeping up with the Kardashians, which is not trashy. <laughs> it is the opposite. Okay. High class TV right there. Yeah. Before we go, before I ask you more specific researchy questions, could you tell me a little bit about what you, what you study in uh, some very simple terms? So soft matter is um, materials that are easily deformable either by temperature or by external forces. So um, for instance, I can, an example of a not soft matter is my, my mug. Um, I can't easily deform it with my hands. And if I heat it up, it stays the same shape. Um, versus something like my handy dandy silly putty, which I keep next to my desk. Um, so silly putty is the children's toy. And if I was to go ahead and deform it or pull on it, it easily deforms with pressure from my hands. And so we study soft matter because it actually forms a lot of things in life around us. Um, we are soft matter. <laughs> um, a lot of biological systems are soft matter. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you can easily deform like your cheek, for instance. So tissue can be soft matter. Um, lots of foods and fl <laughs> lots of foods that we deal with are soft matter. Toothpaste is a good example. Ketchup. Um, and even some, some things like 
uh, different liquids can act soft. Um, so we can apply some soft matter physics to liquids, but inherently um, you can kind of think of soft matter as like this weird place in between a liquid and a solid. So you know, bringing back the example of silly putty, um, it looks pretty solid if I just hit it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really change shape too much. But if I was to pull on it, it can stretch and deform just like a liquid. And if I was to, to form it into a ball and leave it on my table, it would flow just like a liquid would. It just takes a lot longer. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, that's the subject in a, in a nutshell, a silly putty nut shell. <laughs> um, I guess shell. it's an egg. Shoot. <laughs> I think you can buy like them in peanut containers. Like yeah, they're shaped like peanuts. Of? Mr. Peanut or something? I don't know. Hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, you, I guess, don't study silly putty specifically. You do a variety of things. Um, what excites you at the moment? What are you, what are you focusing on these days? Let's see. These it days... is actually silly putty. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Um, so these days, we've been looking at um, this really interesting place that's in between a liquid and a granular material. So you can think of granular material just being like a pile of sand, for instance. So a bunch of, or a, on a bigger scale, like a bunch of rocks that are held together, that are hang out together, I guess. Um, and so if you think about a liquid, a liquid is made up of atoms or molecules, depending on what the liquid is. And those are individual particles. At, if you look at a, a pile of sand, for instance, you can see each of those sand grains, um, but each of those are individual particles. And as you get to smaller and smaller particle sizes, so you, you shrink your grains of sand down to be smaller and smaller, we start to see behavior that we usually see in liquids. Okay. So the question, so the question that we're looking at is how does, or how small do we have to get in order for uh, individual granular material, so like discrete material, where you can see each of the grains individually, becomes a continuous material like a liquid. Because you wouldn't point out a piece of liquid and be like, that's one individual liquid particle. There's I mean, a piece of liquid right there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we're, so we're, the project that I'm kind of working on is looking at um, this phenomena called the plateau Rayleigh instability. And you can see this in, in just by turning on your tap, your water tap. Um, if you were, so if you're to go to your bathroom sink, I guess, and just turn it on so you have a stream of, of liquid coming down, you actually see that further down the stream, that liquid breaks up into droplets. This is what we call the Rayleigh plateau instability. And we can see this phenomenon every day with a tap. If the jet is thick enough, the instability doesn't have enough time to build up before the water reaches the sink and the jet is shaped like a cylinder. On the other hand, if the flow rate is reduced and the jet gets thinner, the cylinder breaks up into droplets. Um, quick question before we go a little bit further though. Um, yeah. Can you like compare, I don't know, like a pile of sand to like a puddle of water? Would that be like a... If you take a, a pile of, or if you pour some sand onto your desk or whatever, I don't recommend that. That sounds like very messy. If you um, pour sand into your bed. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> It'll be very gritty. Um, yeah, if you pour sand into a pile and if you were to keep pouring on it, you actually find that the sand pile just grows like this. So it just keeps getting taller and taller and wider and wider. That depend on like how the, the sand grains interact with each other. So specifically uh, how the friction between each of those individual sand grains holds each, each other up. Uh, if you were to pour your coffee or your tea in the same manner on your desk, which also don't recommend, um, you'll notice that instead of it growing up, actually initially it grows into a little, a little cap, it looks like a sphere. And then if you add more liquid, it starts to spread out horizontally and it, it reaches a maximum puddle height uh, that depends on the materials that you're using. Um, and then it will just keep growing in a two-dimensional manner. So it only grows out, it doesn't grow up. So some folks in our lab have been looking at um, what if we take little teeny tiny bubbles or droplets and start piling them up? Do that, does it behave like a, a sand pile or does it behave like a puddle of water? 
Okay, so cool. That's kind of the interplay between the two. Okay, so puddles or piles, and you are doing something similar. You're taking, um, well, the example you were about to explain before I rudely cut you off was the plateau Rayleigh instability. So, but yeah, you you were saying that you would see it more in the kitchen, probably. Typically. Yeah, yeah. If you just turn on your your tap in a, at a very gentle, like not when it's just like rushing out, but like when it's a very gentle stream. The smaller the the jet, actually, the the faster the the droplets break up. Okay, so that's that's the liquid version, and you're doing something with particles. Yeah, so I'm making some very small bu air bubbles, and I'm producing them in a line. Um, and I'm looking at how that stream of bubbles breaks up with time. Um, and we do see like pretty, so what's characteristic about the plateau really instability, so those, the, that jet breaking up into droplets is that uh, if you have a, a cylinder, if you just have a straight line, a straight jet, uh, that's the same thickness all the way across, you'll break up into very regularly spaced droplets. So say you get four in one length. Okay. And so what I'm seeing with my, with my cluster of bubbles, so my cylinder of bubbles, if you will, is that we also see very similar um, wavelengths pop up. Okay, that is very surprising to me. Why do they interact with each other? They're, they're, they have to be interacting with each other, right? For them to break up into these discrete lumps? Yeah. Um, so one way that I've been working on this project is looking at kind of a 2D cylinder. So instead of it being a stream of liquid going like vertical, uh, I lay them out horizontally on the surface of water. So if you, you take your bubbles and like line them up on the surface of a water bath, they will, that's essentially how I'm doing it. So you get like a strip of bubbles rather than a cylinder. Okay. Um, and those bubbles all have a meniscus associated with them. Um, so you probably learned about that in like high school chemistry class when you're measuring liquids. The mm -hmm. meniscus is like that little bit of liquid that like, as you get nearer to the edge of a glass, there's like a little bit of water that will just like shroop yeah. up to the side of the glass. Um, so each air bubble actually has a little meniscus that's associated with it. And there's another phenomenon called the Cheerios effect that essentially wants the, if you have two air bubbles that are far, we're getting into like very <laughs> phenomena and <laughs> phenomena. <laughs> uh, if you have two air bubbles that, bubbles that are far apart, they'll that actually attract each other on the surface of the water. Just like if you have a bowl of Cheerios, hence the name, in mm -hmm. your milk, uh, the Cheerios will clump up next to each other. Okay, so if you have a strip of these bubbles, it's like having a strip of, of Cheerios. Exactly. And they, they probably won't stay in that strip. They're probably exactly. going to do some sort of break up and... Cluster together. Clustering. Into, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, and that's because uh, it takes energy to make a meniscus. So nature wants us to minimize the amount of meniscus because that costs energy. Right, uh, And it can do that by making clusters instead of having a straight line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It pulls less fluid up if they're, you know, all bunched together. Exactly. Interesting. So this is like um, a very much like a solid interacting with liquid phenomenon that is turning into what you would see just in a liquid. Yeah. Sort of. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. That's really sweet. Yeah. I mean, like, not sweet, like, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> that's... <laughs> it, is a, it is a very cute project. I guess they, the, your little bubble Cheerio guys are coming together and cuddling up. They are hugging. They just, want, they just, they just want to hug. <laughs> that's nice. What can we say? <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's very counterintuitive. I, I, you would think if we're talking about discrete particles that, like, like sand or something, that they don't attract each other necessarily. They would just sort of who cares where they go, but there's, you're saying that there is some attraction between them. Yeah. I think it does depend on the system. Cause I think if you were to take a stream of, of, uh, sand and just like pour it out, like from a funnel or something, I don't know if you would see the same thing. I think there definitely has to be an attractive component right. to the particles in particular, just like how molecules of liquid are still attracted to each other. That's why we have surface tension because liquid wants to be in contact with itself more than it wants to be in contact with like some other material. 
Right. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. If there was no attraction between particles, then they would just be, you know, in free fall or whatever. Yeah. They just don't, they don't really care if they touch each other. Yeah. They wouldn't even know if there was another one. Yeah. (laughs) They wouldn't even know. (laughs) Poor little guys. They don't even know. So that's what you're doing now. Um, So when we're talking about these bubbles, like roughly how big would you say they are? You can see that they're there with your eye, but you can't see them. Like you can't differentiate individual ones, if that makes sense. Like you can see that there's bubbles, there are bubbles there on in the material, but there's not like, you're not like bubble number one, bubble number two. Right, okay. So like on the order of like maybe 50 microns. Yeah. You could fit like 10 of them in a millimeter probably. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Something like that. Okay, so really small. Yeah. But yeah, as far as as far as soft matter goes, this isn't really like silly putty exactly, but it is combining various things. I mean, there's a whole field of of soft matter that looks at foams and at colloids, which are just little bits of round things and other liquids. <laughs> Let's see. I accidentally almost segued into talking about um, some at-home physics, though. Um, I guess one of the cool things about soft matter is that you were saying that it, it, a lot of things are soft matter, um, including, you know, you had an example of a kitchen thing. And you had a student this summer doing experiments in the kitchen? Yeah, I had an uh, undergrad student. Uh, her name is Julia Aziz, and she was in Ottawa, which is not in Hamilton. Um, I didn't know that. I thought she was in Hamilton. No, she was very far away from us. Oh. Um, and so COVID regulations meant that we weren't allowed to have people who weren't trained in the lab be in the lab. So she went home. Um, and so we had to come up with a project that she could do because we didn't want to waste her summer with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and you weren't just going to fire her or something. Yeah, that would have been mean. Yeah. Um, the other option was having her do data analysis, but like, that's not quite as fun. So we shipped her a bunch of, of equipment and she was studying uh, what's known as the viscous coiling effect. Um, and you can see this at home if you have some honey or some molasses. In fact, she was using molasses. Um, and if you hold, if you scoop up some molasses and like hold it from a height where it hits like your toast or whatever, um, you start seeing it coil around itself. Okay. Yep. That, that visual is familiar to me. I'm, I'm kind of thinking like the honey nut Cheerios, like honey dropper yeah. looking thing. And like those really nice slow-mo bits where like the, the honey's coming down and like. Exactly. It coils around itself. Yeah. Or like a soft serve ice cream dispenser or something. Yeah. That's also a really good example. <laughs> I've actually been th- <laughs> trying to think of like good examples you can you see the same thing if you were like rock climbing and you throw a rope down oh yeah yeah it yeah, coils yeah. the same way or if you like drop a snake head first. <laughs> i don't recommend that but you know if you're living above a reptile zoo maybe you can try yeah i think there's a good jungle book scene that i can maybe grab a clip from on youtube like the original jungle book cartoon where like a caw gets yanked down Okay. And you like oh, maybe. And like yeah. Around, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> I could definitely see that being animated anyway. <laughs> okay, so she was studying that with yeah. molasses. Yeah. So we, so we sent sorry? What's the the mystery there? What's the the unknown phenomenon? Yes. So uh, the behavior where it like coils is pretty well understood. So we understand that. Um, but we were wondering what happens if you start rotating the coil as it's falling. So in this case, like it's like you're rotating your piece of toast, if you will. So we, she just had it rotating on a, a platform. And we were wondering like, what's the interaction between the, the coil or the, the, the molasses and the platform? So if we spin it while it's coiling, what happens? Okay. So I can, I can imagine if you're, you know, dropping something and this is spinning, that there might be some like amount of drag. Yeah. I'm just thinking like what happens when you like drop a record player needle or something. Yeah. 
spinning record or anything really, I guess, onto a spinning record, there'd be some amount of drag, but depending on like the rates of things, you're going to get different results, I guess. Yeah. Is so we found that, so if she's dropping it directly where the, uh, dropping it on the center of, of the rotation. So she's coiling it right at the center. Um, if you spin it in the direction that the coil is spinning, wait, no, if you spin it in the direction opposite of the coil, you actually get super coiling. So you get these really interesting corkscrew patterns that come out. Okay. And you can think of this like if you were to take your phone cord, your old fashioned phone cord, and you were to twist it a little bit more, um, at first it gets, the, the coil gets narrower, uh -huh. and then you start seeing weird stuff. Right? right? Right. This is your area of expertise, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, you, you tighten the phone cord, the coily phone cord. Yeah. And, and eventually it starts doing, it starts popping out or. Yeah. You get these yeah. like weird loops and knots. Exactly. And stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. We didn't, we didn't quite see that. We only got, she only could make it go fast enough so that we saw like corkscrewing. Okay. Um, but then if you go the other way, we actually would see that the, the coil at a certain speed was spontaneously flip directions. So it decided that it didn't want to be coiling in the way it was coiling originally and would change directions to go the other way. Okay, so is this like uncoiling your, your phone cord? The, the loop yeah. gets wider and wider and wider and then all of a sudden it pops and then forms a different kind of knot? Yeah, but what's interesting is that we didn't actually see a difference in width of the coil it okay. would just it just randomly changed directions which is kind of cool it looked like it was just like nope <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> don't want to do this anymore that surprises me quite a lot yeah it takes me to the core <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it i'm still kind of thinking about it yeah that's weird okay yeah i am so that i think one of the issues is that she was taking videos with her phone camera um and from only one angle because that's what she had to, to do it with. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to set, recreate the setup in the lab and maybe take videos from different angles so we can kind of get a 3D appreciation for what's going on. Ah, uh, okay. Because if we're looking at it from like the horizontal plane, we might be missing stuff versus the vertical. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, but pretty, pretty fun results for a project that you, we weren't really expecting anything to come out of because she's doing it in her kitchen. Yeah. That's, that's really encouraged. That's, that's fun. Yeah. I kind of want to play with that this afternoon when, uh, we make some when toast. we're done here, maybe. Yeah. Huh. Make some toast. That's sweet. So that, um, the molasses is sweet. Or honey. It kind of, uh, brings me to something that, uh, I sometimes talk to people about um, you're not solving a world crisis with this molasses loop. This is a very like fundamental um, thing. It's almost like on the level of, of math or something like it's a, a phenomenon that happens in various places, but there's no necessarily immediate um, way to monetize it per se. Um, what do you think? What do you think of that? <laughs> Yeah, so I think if we're always chasing, in research, if we're always chasing problems that we think are going to make money out of, I think we're just going to be very narrow in our mindset, which I think we can kind of see already in the field of science in Canada in particular. Um, we see us going down a route of, we, we joke about this, like writing grants for stuff. It's like either you have to have the word quantum, you have to have the word artificial intelligence, those two words, or you have to have the word cancer in your grants or your, your anything that you're asking for money in order to actually get the money. Right, right. Okay. Or to be wildly approved for it. Mm -hmm. um, even better if you have two or more of those words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that, that like the field of science is so much more than just quantum materials, cancer, and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I think we as humans are naturally curious and i think it's it's in our nature to be looking into you know 
Why does molasses coil? Why do tree branches on trees grow a certain way? These are all like really interesting things that, you know, I've thought about mm -hmm. when I'm out hiking or whatever. And this, it's not always just about whether we can make money out of something. And I don't think it should ever be that way. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I would talk to Ben, our uh, ex lab mate, Ben oh. Davis Purcell. Yeah. And uh, I gave him some quick fire questions. Um, I don't remember the questions I asked him, but maybe I can fire some at you and, and get your opinion. What has been your go-to uh, work from home lunch? Whatever leftover I have from dinner. Nice. Are you cooking more or less than before? Uh, definitely more because I have leftovers from dinner that I don't have to pack to bring to school. Excellent. I hate packing lunch. <laughs> so do you work like a nine to five? Like, do you sit down for your day of work and then go straight through and then shut off at night? Or do you do some other technique? Um, I kind of follow the nine to five very roughly. I'll usually take breaks throughout the day. I'll like go for a walk or um, whatever. Right. And then usually by the time evening hits, I don't want to work anymore. Right. Um, if, uh, if you're in the middle of the day of work and you're feeling real brain dead, what's, uh, what's your go-to thing to uh, revitalize you? Usually the walk. the walk. A walk does it, yeah. Is that, do you think it's because it's cold out and it you know, wakes you up? Or was this also the summer you would also do this? This was also something that I'd do in the summer. I think just uh -huh. taking a break from looking at the screen really, really yeah. does, it for, does something for me. <laughs> think your eyesight has been getting better or worse with working from home and on the computer um definitely if it were going one way probably worse uh, i don't have like people to bug here so yeah are you sticking with your uh you know 20 minutes of work two minutes of not looking at the screen or something what, what was the the suggestion uh, i don't remember i think it was like no. 15 and 15 and 5 or something i don't know <laughs> Obviously, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah. I try to look out my window at the Big B parking lot across the street. I mean, you, there's always exciting stuff going on over there. So, What is your favorite sci-fi book or movie? I don't really watch or read a lot of sci-fi. Um, I watched Interstellar the other day, and that was, that, was, that was all right. That was pretty good. Oh, that's the one where, like... He goes into a black hole, and you're like, wait a second. The quantum of love or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> It was good up until that point. And I was like, okay. 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 Yeah. I remember that one being kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, obviously not like rigorous, but. <laughs> I mean, up at, like up until that point, it was like moderately okay. Everything was quite plausible. Okay. Um, what has been a good diversion for you during, I mean, during grad school in general, you could, you can talk about, but um, recently as well is, is fine. Crafts. Any so, particular or all of them? Oh, I'm I'm a big fan of picking up random, th picking up hobbies and then putting them back down again. Uh, okay. So like, for instance, I've been, throughout most of grad school, I've been doing pottery as a pretty consistent side hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been fun. That's a cool one. That actually is kind of soft mattery. It is. You, uh, kiln it. It's really cool. Oh, well, even in the kiln, you get uh, like the really... Taylor instability oh. where you get like these drips of the glaze yeah and then you get different like instabilities if like you use one glaze that is a lot more viscous than another so if it's a lot thicker um you get like fingering instabilities right they can kind of separate and stuff yeah and, and phase separation mechanics. <laughs> you can do crack mechanics <laughs> yeah there's crazing too oh. i don't really want to do crazy yeah it's, yeah. it's actually a very rich field of physics yeah that's sweet uh do you want to show off any any pottery I, I know i didn't prepare you for this but uh well the mug i've been drinking out of has it's a carmen original it's a carmen original it's a got some face separation i didn't realize that that's that's a beautiful mug i, I really you. like that all right well thank you for tuning in that's the alma mac this week I'm your host, Adam. If you want to hear other episodes, you can head to scientificcanada.ca. Thanks a lot.